A lot of you really liked my videos where I talked about the top 10 R packages that you should know. So then I figured, then why not talk about the top 10 Python packages you should know? Well, that's what we're gonna do in this video. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. So let's suppose you're learning Python for the first time. When I'm making this video, it's the year 2024, so I'm sure there's plenty of people out there for whom that's the case. Well, I know it can be pretty daunting when you go open up somebody's script and there's like 20 packages at the top that they're importing. More often than not though, you really don't have to do that. You can focus on a few fundamental packages, learn those really well, and your abilities to do data science in Python will accelerate very rapidly. And I can promise you, if you learn the 10 packages that I'm gonna go through in this video, you're going to be in great shape. So before I do that, take a moment to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Now let's get to it. So the first one we're going to start with is going to come as a surprise to absolutely nobody, and that's Pandas. Pandas is the core data manipulation, analysis, and data science library of Python. And part of the reason for that is because Pandas gives us the series and data frame objects, which are very helpful for us actually loading data and getting it into an appropriate format so we can move on and do more exciting things with it, which Pandas also gives us those capabilities. So this pandas cheat sheet here comes from PyData, and it's absolutely outstanding and has pretty much everything you need right here. There's two pages here. Now on the left side of the first page, we've got everything around creating data frames. As we move to the right, we have things around changing the structure, sorting, re-indexing, and these are gonna be some of the most important functions in the whole package. Things like sort values, sort index, reset index, and drop, those are super helpful functions. And then as we start moving down, you've got functions for subsetting observations and variables. That should also be one of the very first things you focus on getting comfortable with. As we go to the second page, we start getting methods for summarizing and grouping data. Value counts, describe, and unique, shape, those are all things you'll probably use every single day. The grouping stuff at the bottom can take a little while to get used to, so that's definitely something I recommend practicing a bit to get the hang of. Now I recommend pandas as the first one because it's pretty easy to pick up and it's also going to help you to do the most the fastest. But another package that's arguably even more foundational, and this is another one that will come as a surprise to absolutely nobody, is NumPy. NumPy is a fundamental package for scientific computing and handling large data sets in Python because it supports multi-dimensional large arrays and matrices and gives us functionality for working with them. Here's a publicly available cheat sheet for NumPy. This one is created by DataCamp and this one is only a one pager. So the first section on the left is all showing us how to create arrays. In particular, one function I use a lot is np.arrange. It looks like it's pronounced arrange, but it's actually pronounced a range. And then np.random is useful sometimes as well. But then as we go towards the middle, there's lots of arithmetic and matrix type operations. And on the right side is some of the most important stuff all around subsetting, slicing, indexing, and array manipulation. So definitely good stuff to get comfortable with. And now there's one function I use all the time that isn't actually on this cheat sheet. That function is np.where. So that's basically like an if else statement that's super clean and easy to use. But yeah, anyway, that's NumPy. Number three on this list is gonna be another totally unsurprising one. That's matplotlib. So matplotlib is an incredibly powerful and flexible package that's going to allow us to create and customize graphs. Now, I don't wanna say you could literally make any possible 2D plot that you could imagine, but with matplotlib, it's pretty close. So this is matplotlib's official cheat sheet. And to be honest about this one, this one is probably a little difficult for a beginner to get used to. I'd say the most useful thing here is probably the starter code at the top where we're defining figure and axis objects. And then it breaks down the anatomy of a figure down below. It's sort of helpful to think about a matplotlib figure in these components, and they're all just components that we're writing code to alter. So you've got major and minor ticks, 
title, objects on a graph like lines, grids, and y and x axes here. Then we've got a lot of helper lines of code under this quick reminder section on the right side. See, you can do things like set the x or y limits, x or y labels, x or y ticks, so on and so forth. But honestly, my recommendation is just to go to the matplotlib website, look at some examples, see how the pieces of code come together, and then try to create a few. Before long, you'll get the hang of it. We're gonna move on to another plotting library for number four, and that's Seaborn. Now actually with Seaborn, it's based on matplotlib, and whatever you do, I do also recommend learning matplotlib because that is really going to ingrain a lot of fundamentals of plotting in Python for you. But Seaborn is worth learning too because the syntax is amazingly succinct and simple. And when you go trying to customize more complex visualizations, it's going to make your life a lot easier. This Seaborn cheat sheet over here comes from Datacamp again, and I think this one's a lot easier for beginners to get a handle of compared to the matplotlib one because it actually gives us some guided examples. So it starts in section one with loading some pre-built data sets. In the second section, we can use the matplotlib code to alter the size of the plot, and then the Seaborn code to change some of the style. Then as you can see from section three, the code is quite straightforward. You just define the data you're using, your x and y axes, and sometimes any ancillary variables like this lm plot that changes the hue using the species variable, and then you're pretty much good to go. Then there's plenty of examples as we move from the right down of different types of plots you can make in Seaborn. Again, very powerful stuff. This combination of matplotlib and Seaborn is a must know for anyone picking up Python. Now the fifth package here is actually a much smaller and simpler one, but it really is the unsung hero in a lot of work, and that's date time. So in basically anything with the possible exception of SQL, working with dates and times is painful. It's painful in R, and it's painful in Python too. Date time though is going to give us classes for working with dates and times. So whatever it is you're trying to do, whether it's arithmetic or manipulation or setting up a model, date time is gonna make your life easier. Now at the time I'm recording this video, I don't think there's any easy cheat sheet for date time the way there is for the others up to this point, but the documentation is pretty quick and easy to use. You can see first you've got a date method that returns an object with convenient year, month, and day attributes. You've got a similar thing for the time method, and then you've got a date time that puts both of these two things together into one. Not to mention you've got the now and today methods, which come in handy a lot. And lastly, I don't really know how to pronounce these, but you've got strf time and strp time for going back and forth between date time and string objects. Now we're gonna get into some really fun stuff. Number six on this list is stats models. And now for those of you coming from an R background, you're going to absolutely love stats models. What it's gonna do is give us classes and functions for running statistical models and producing summaries of them. And these summaries are very R-like, for lack of a better term. They're very easy to set up and very clean looking. This is another package that doesn't have a clean, easy cheat sheet like some of the others, but again, the documentation is fairly easy to follow along with. It's pretty easy if we go over here to the ordinary least squares example. So they start by generating some artificial data, generating an intercept by using a column of ones, and then fitting an sm.ols object down below. They use fit and summary methods and then look at that output. Told you, if you're used to R, it's going to look pretty familiar. And even if you aren't, then this is going to make it so easy to use for you that you're not even gonna to need to use R. You have all of exactly the same output, but most importantly, you have all of your coefficients, their standard errors, t-statistics, and p-values in this nice clean table. And this is a pretty quick example, but as you can see from the contents on the left side, there's plenty of stuff that you can do using stats models. At the time I'm recording this, it's only version 0.15, but it's still extremely reliable, powerful, and something that you should have in your Python repertoire. 
There's no list of Python packages that would be complete without number seven, which is, of course, the famous scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is the fundamental machine learning offering in Python. So in it, we get all kinds of tools for your standard classification, regression, clustering algorithms, all that good stuff. But you also get tons of tools for the full machine learning pipeline. So data pre-processing, fitting, evaluation, really anything that you can need. Luckily, scikit-learn is another one of those packages which has a nice cheat sheet for it. Again, this one comes from Datacamp, and this one from start to end gives us a really nice workflow. At the upper left, we have a super basic, compact example, but we can start to add some more to all of these different pieces. As we move down, we've got the train test split function, under that, we have the fit function. At the bottom, the predict and predict proba functions. Predict proba gives us the model's estimated probability of a particular label, so this is super helpful. And then you've got all these useful pre-processing methods. Things like standardization, normalization, encoding categorical features, imputing missing values. And on the right side, you have things like confusion matrices or metrics like mean squared error, R squared score, various clustering metrics. So you get the idea. You really have everything you need for most machine learning pipelines right here with scikit-learn. Number eight on this list is one of my personal favorites and that's Streamlit. So for those of you who've been following my channel for a long time, you might know that I'm a big fan of R Shiny. There are other options, but Streamlit is by far and away my favorite option in Python for creating shareable web applications. I find this to make prototyping a lot faster, and it can save you and your audience a ton of time compared to creating a ton of scripts or notebooks. So this cheat sheet here comes directly from Streamlit. You have to do some scrolling within each of the boxes to get everything here. And honestly, Streamlit is another one of those packages that you're not going to learn everything just from reading a cheat sheet. You have to try building your own apps. Once you do that, this stuff will eventually just come naturally for you. But anyway, you have various command line stuff at the top, followed by magic, control flow, and connecting to data sources. The stuff you need for displaying text and displaying data follows. So you can use st.text, st.markdown, st.write. You can use st.dataframe or st.table for data. And then there's all this interactive stuff in the middle, which again, the best way to get a feel for this is to write your own code or at least go to the gallery and look at some examples. One last thing I do want to point out are these two sections on the right for caching data objects and caching resources. If you start developing an app with multiple pages or that generally just has a lot going on, you're definitely going to want to incorporate these caching decorators. Otherwise, your app is going to be super slow. We're going to close this list out with the beloved neural network packages. So number nine then, to no surprise, will be TensorFlow. TensorFlow is another full machine learning framework that's going to help us build and train neural network models. So you can start to get your feet wet with this a little bit by using the Tensor Playground, and the link to that will be in the description. But TensorFlow is going to give us the foundation for the next package, and is going to be your first go-to for deep learning tasks and non-trivial neural network models. There's a site out there called Zero to Mastery, and it's got some of the best TensorFlow documentation I've seen. So I'll keep this one pretty quick because some of it's going to be covered under the next package. But you start with your basic tensor operations. Those are going to be the fundamental building blocks for the rest of what we do. So you're doing basic math and reshaping them. Then as you go down, you get into creating layers creating basic neural network models, compiling them, training them, evaluating them. Then as we go down, various data pre-processing steps. And as it keeps going down, there's more functionality around creating more advanced models, say by using the functional API. So again, you've got a massive framework here that's gonna allow you to perform virtually any step of a machine learning pipeline, specifically in the context of neural networks. As you may or may not have guessed by this point, number 10 on this list is Keras. So Keras is gonna give us another high-level neural networks framework, but this one is probably a little bit more user-friendly and simple. 
You can rapidly prototype deep learning models while still having the flexibility to customize every aspect of the model that you're building. And technically, since TensorFlow has incorporated Keras as its official high-level API, under the hood when you're using TensorFlow, you're essentially using Keras as well. Now closing this off with another one of these super clean and compact cheat sheets from DataCamp, they have one for Keras as well. And just like in the scikit-learn cheat sheet, they start with a super stripped down basic example and flesh more stuff out on the rest of the page. There's pre-processing, stuff like one hot encoding on the left side. Then in the middle, we saw some of the stuff in the TensorFlow documentation. But for your major neural network types, like your multi-layer perceptrons, your CNNs and your RNNs, you've got methods that you import and then layers that you can add on top of your model. Then on the right side, you can inspect the model, summary and get weights are helpful functions. And then as you go down, you can compile these models, fit them, evaluate them, fine tune them. So this is yet again another instance where this stuff may or may not look really abstract, and really you don't totally get the hang of it until you start practicing it. But Keras is another super useful package to have under your belt, and this cheat sheet will be a great reference for it. All right, so that's been 10 Python packages that, at the time I'm making this video, and probably for many years to come, if you know these really well, they're going to help you to solve a tremendous number of data science problems. Learn and practice these packages by using the cheat sheets as resources and just working through some examples. You'll be amazed with how confident you feel with the Python language as a whole when you're done. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button. If you didn't enjoy it, I suppose you're free to hit the dislike button as well. Then leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. What's your favorite Python package and anything that you think I really excluded here? Then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.